it looks beautiful, but you have to ask yourself, what are you using it for? So if you are, uh, if you want to get video of your site for your website, you know what I mean? That's wonderful. Um, you can you can do some high level stuff. You can check out where things are, but fundamentally, if you want to know where accurate. You know, if you want an accurate representation of your site or you want to do some useful things, then you're much better off using uh, different types of sensors, different types of cameras, laser range uh, detection to actually uh, have a better data product. Off-the-shelf cameras, so you know, uh, digital uh, SLRs. So um, you know, you're taking just stills. Uh, but what we do on a UAV is those stills are georeferenced, which means that we can tag to the photograph the uh, the orientation of the photograph and also its location. And because you're taking thousands of photographs, you can start creating 3D maps of the ground, so they become engineering tools. Um, there are different types of photographs. So there's your standard photographs, and then you can use filters, so we can look at multi-spectral so we can understand how vegetation changes over time. Uh, we look at thermal, uh, infrared, so the typical ones you see with security applications where the, where the thief is, is glowing red, those, those kind of uh, applications. And that's video as well as stills. And then going away from photography, you're getting into uh, lasers. So you're using a laser to shine at the ground and looking at the return to actually create your map instead. And that is very, very accurate. It's more expensive, so it's a different data product. Um, but uh, that's that's another way of, of, again, basically, we're always building a 3D map of something is what we're doing and there's different ways of doing it. If you want your golf course and a nice, a nice uh, a video of your golf course, you buy your $400 drone from Best Buy, stick a GoPro, and away you go. And there's nothing wrong with that. But we have the small uh, copters. You have multi-rotors, which are easy to fly and very, very stable. Uh, but they're not a huge payload. Then you start getting bigger and bigger. So you've got the single rotor, electric, and then, and then finally gas-powered, which is what we use. Um, they become more expensive and much harder to operate, but you can carry heavier payloads for longer. So it just depends on the application. And as well as the rotor aircraft, you actually have the fixed wing so you have the, they, they tend to be able to fly for longer different type of application you know if you're doing exploration for example you may go fixed wing or a wildlife survey whereas for a construction site um, it's it, it's it's a rotor aircraft is the way to go it's much more stable and you can maneuver it in smaller areas much more accurately You can get into a lot of trouble, and uh, the regulator, Transport Canada, is starting to really uh, crack down on this. So you need to, if you're running a commercial operation, and you don't have to be paid money, by the way, to have a commercial operation, you need to get an SFOC, which is basically permission from Transport Canada. Um, and there's there's some things you have to go through. A lot of people tell uh, companies that they're exempt. They don't need to have an SFOC, is what it's called. Uh, unfortunately, uh, that's not the case. You have to have one. Uh, and if you don't have an SFOC, your insurance is dependent on a uh, on operating within the boundaries of the SFOC. So not having the permission from the regulator means you are likely not insured, which is no good for anybody, okay? Um, and also, it's not just the uh, permission from the uh, regulator, uh, also permission from the landowner. And we've seen this on a number of occasions where we've actually flown quite close to boundaries or potentially going over a boundary from one landowner to another. And if you have that boundary incursion, you can also get into trouble. So you have to take quite a lot of care, care in, um, in actually getting getting permission from multiple people. It's, it's a complicated part of the planning process. It's removing people from the equation. If you have people climbing up buildings, you know, or having to repel or having to, you know, uh, go up ladders, uh, or even just inspections at night, be boots on the ground, you're at night if it's cold. Um, a, the data products don't tend to be quite as good, but B, there's a huge health and safety impact. So uh, as long as you have nobody in the area where you're flying these things, so there's no, there's no human being collision, much, much safer. You're going to lose a few tens of thousands of dollars worth of drone and equipment, worst case, but you have the insurance. And on the other side, where we see is um, we get customers who use manned helicopters, for example, for power line inspections, wanting to start using drones because people die every year, uh, you know, in manned aircraft. And if you don't have to fly a manned aircraft, if, you know, use a drone instead. Again, it's loss of equipment, but safety is a huge, huge driver in this industry. Um, and, uh, you know, insurance is a big implication there as well. But it's, it's, it's a very important thing uh, to consider.